So first of all, I want to say thank you very much for inviting me here to talk about the most magnificent of all of our mammals and why it's really, really important to save humanity that we study bats. And thank you very much for a very, very kind introduction. I now am going to have to live up to that, am not I? But what I want to do today is I want to talk to you a little bit about why studying non-model organisms, why having a biological, zoological approach can help us address these grand challenges that we face in society. And one of the biggest challenges society faces today is how we're going to deal with our ever-aging populations. And I want to talk to you about how studying bats can help us uncover the secret of extended health span, that what we can do to increase, again, our lifespan, but from really this, I suppose, right now aspect, the, a, near, a near life extension possibility. But before we do this, let's talk about what actually is aging. So everybody knows what aging actually is. You can look at young human, old human, and you realize the difference. You can look at an old dog, or you can look at a pup. So we understand what aging is, but we don't necessarily understand all the biological things that change that cause the aging process. And aging is inherently integrated and complex. Now there's lots and lots of definitions about what aging is. I really like Steve um, Ousted's definition. It's a process of intrinsic, progressive, and generalized physical deterioration that occurs over time, beginning at about the age of reproductive maturity. This is what aging is supposed to be. And really, from the dawn of civilization, humans have been trying to better understand the aging process with a view to stopping it or relieving its maladies. And we're still right there. So what causes aging? And this is, I think, one of the a better summaries. I really like the summary by Lopez Otin. And if you look at it, there's about these 13, well, nine different hallmarks here. One of them is genomic instability, telomere attrition, epigenetic alterations, loss of proteostasis, deregulated nutrient sensing, mitochondrial dysfunction, cellular senescence, stem cell exhaustion, altered intercellular communication. Now, these are all things that we know happen as we age. But whether they're the cause of aging or the result of aging, we're not really quite sure yet. So we need to understand the complexity of the aging process if we want to find a way to stop it or to alleviate it. So what do we know right now about how you can stop aging? Well, you can spend your life starving. You can spend your life very hungry and you're going to have the most exquisite vascular processes. There's supposed to be lots of side effects to this, so eating maybe 400 calories a day, there's some experiments whereby you find you will not produce testosterone, you're rather irritable, but you're gonna live long and healthy, but you really wanna live like that. Extreme marathon runners are also shown that if you have that level of exercise, again, you're able to extend your life, maybe by two years, it's estimated. But do you really want to spend two years of your life running? I don't. You have Reservatol, which is found in red wine. I think it's a nice plan. That can also, has been shown to be associated with people living longer. Or these drugs, such as rapamycin, a drug that was found originally as an antibiotic in, in Easter Island, was fed to the mice, and the mice lived much longer. But again, all of these different ways of extending your life aren't necessarily that pleasant and there's potentially side effects. So we don't yet know or it's not widely accepted how we're supposed to stop or reverse aging. So we need to keep researching this area. I read this and again working on bats, working on the only true vampires. I read the idea of this vampire molecule. So these grisly studies done whereby they took an old mouse and they sewed it onto a young mouse and they sewed up all of their different blood vessels. And what they found was that the older mouse got younger and the younger mouse got older. They did a less grisly experiment whereby they took the blood from a young mouse, stuck it into an old mouse and that old mouse got younger. And it was argued that this GDF11 was this vampire protein that potentially mediated this change. But what we've now found, or what this has caused huge consternation because another very active research group came out and argued, no, 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 that was not the protein. But actually, if you inject GDF11 on its own, 
these mice actually get older rather than younger. So there's still lots of controversy over this. But there's a huge movement in the US looking at this young blood therapeutics, whereby you can go and get the plasma from young, healthy individuals. And as an older person, you can put it into you and hopefully you're going to get younger. So there's lots of movement here. But this is just to say that we still don't know what actually are the active proteins that are driving this potential rejuvenation. So there's still a lot of research that needs to be done. I believe the Rolling Stones get their blood changed regularly. Just saying. Doesn't do many good though. Right? <laughs> <laughs> They're still here, aren't they? They're still here. So the grand challenge. So society is faced with the grand challenge. So we're interested in aging. It's very complex. We haven't yet untangled all of the mechanisms and the way that drives aging. We need to understand it. And the reason is this. So this was taken in Time magazine, February 2015, from the front cover. It's estimated that baby born today could live till, till they're 142 years of age. I know there's a lot of aging researchers who have a bet on that an individual is already born and she will live till she's at least 150. But why should we be worried about this? And the reason is for this. So what happens, so despite the fact that we are trying to understand aging and trying to find better ways to alleviate its maladies, we haven't found a solution yet. Now, globally, populations are aging. Everywhere around the world, our populations are getting older and older and older. So the World Health Organization has estimated that there's going to be a 380% increase in people over the age of 80 by 2050. There's also going to be a doubling of people over the age of 60. Now, why this sounds wonderful utopia, the problem is this, that our, our probability of acquiring a disease of the old age, cancer, Alzheimer's, dementia, by the time we're 60 has stayed the same. And so if we are to try and take advantage of this much longer lifespan, we're going to have to increase our health span or else we're going to be, our societies will be full of the incapacitated elderly. And this is going to cost society hugely. So if everybody is living, so if everyone's going to get sick at 60 and stay alive at least till they're 80, till they're 120, but are going to be incapacitated, society is not going to function. So we have to ask ourselves the question, do we want this future? We're full of the incapacitated elderly, where the costs of trying to mind your older relatives are going to be very, very difficult. Or do we want this future? And again, it is facetious, but we've got to think about it. Or is it facetious? Wouldn't it be much better if we could all be functioning members of society until we're in our 120s, 30s, 450s, and so forth? This potentially is where we need to go. Now, whether or not we're going to be able to have babies at 120, I don't know. I don't believe that menopause has been stopped within humans just yet. How do you get a future like that? Well, we need to go back to trying to think about understanding the aging process. If we know what it is that breaks down as we age, therefore we'll be able to find ways to fix it. This is an example of a lot of work is done in, 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 in mice, mice biology, where you find you take an old mouse, stick in a whole bunch of transcriptome factors here, turn it into a younger mouse. That would be this, a way to do this. Could we actually do this? Can we rejuvenate cells? So this is Methuselah, this is a biblical character. Although Methuselah lived a total of 969 years and then he died. So it's taken from Genesis. And this is a supposed re record of the oldest ever living human. Now the question is, can we live until we're nearly a thousand years of age? And I know Aubrey probably will be talking about this. And how long will it take us to get to the stage where our biology or our modified biology can allow us to get there? What do we know right now? Well, on record, the oldest living woman, she's Jeanne Calmont from France. She lived till she was 121, nearly 122 years of age. And right now we have this here where you're born, the morbidity starts to hit us here and then you die. This morbidity is when you start getting ill and you start suffering from disease of the old age. Now, what I want to talk about is how you move from having morbidity here at this time where you compress it 
and that morbidity is for a much, much shorter length of time. It wouldn't be much better if we could get rid of it altogether. The next step down will be extend your health span. If you do this and you have a shallower <coughs> slope here, the death comes later. Extended lifespan, some morbidity is here, but again, you've got a much shallower slope to death. But here's this question here, rejuvenation. So you have, you're born, you suffer a lot of damage, you get older, you rejuvenate. You go back to the start again. Suffer damage, rejuvenate. And these are different ways, potentially, that we can extend human health span and human lifespan. And I'm going to talk about this part here of my research. So it's very important that we find ways and solutions for this grand challenge, because society is going to be wrecked. What are we going to do? But there's roadblocks. There's things that are stopping us finding solutions. And one of them is society. With us, we're stopping it. And I use this quote from Aubrey de Grey, who will talk about this, that I believe that we're in this pro-aging trance. I completely agree with this, because any time you're trying to do any aging research, I have so many people say, sorry, but ethically, should you do this? Sorry, ethically, should not all the old people die to make space for the new people? Essentially, these are the questions you're asked. So we still think that there is positivity towards, there's, there's something positive in aging. Now, maybe this came from some of Kirkwood's hypothesis that um, aging is an evolutionary adaptation. But it's not. Because right now, and I'm just speaking to Aubrey, uh, World Health Organization has now, only now, recognized aging as a disease. And because a lot of aging research has been trying to push it, it's just a disease. And if it's a disease, that means we can fix it. If it's a disease, that means we can find the right drugs to be able to alleviate its maladies. And I would argue that it would be unethical if we didn't. If we could find ways to cure cancer, wouldn't it be unethical to not do it? I don't say the other roadblock, and as a zoologist I'm allowed to say it, is that most aging research, if not nearly all of it, has been completely model organism centric. <coughs> we are studying model organisms to be able to understand how we can slow down aging, how can we reverse it. Now, model organisms are wonderful. They're wonderful laboratory creatures that we have been able to manipulate, that we can house them in the labs, they have lots and lots of babies. They have very short lifespans because that's what we need to, to have. They're very, very um, bad at living and they're very good at dying. So maybe we need to rethink our question. So there has been lots of insights from model organisms. Now these are the likes of Drosophila, C. elegans, mice, Sinopus, humans. And what you find is when you go look at aging right across the tree, what you find is that you can have these conserved different pathways that underlie the aging process. And the reason why this is important is that we can study aging in lots of different diverse taxa and assume that these processes are conserved over time. So therefore, if we study organisms that have much longer health spans, maybe we could then translate that into us. So again, a lot of aging study is done on these short-lived and sometimes inbred populations. Think of mice, think of fruit flies, think of C. elegans. But wouldn't it be much better if we could study aging in long-lived, outbred taxa, species that have naturally evolved extended health spans and extended longevities, that maybe would be more similar to us? Now, again, the question is, does the results that we find from studying model organisms, do these results readily translate? And this is a paper that came out in Cell Metabolism 2018, this year. And it was very interesting. We're back onto this calorie restriction. And what has been shown for sure, in model organisms, if you significantly reduce their calories over an extended period, they show lots of markers of the aging process slowing down. And they knew this. And so you can see that. In animals such as um, fish and mice and worms and so forth, if you restrict calories, they live longer. And this, is, this calorie study was done. You had phase one and phase two, and this is the results of phase two. What they were able to do, they had a lot of volunteers, and they were able to get them to reduce their calorie intake by 15% 
over two years. Uh, by the way, that's not easy. Anybody here has ever tried to be on a diet? It's not easy to maintain for all eternity. And what they found, and they just put them to eat any type of food, and they found that the me metabolic rate dropped. And the production of these free radicals, which drives the aging process, seemed to drop. But the reason why I'm putting a question mark here is that they didn't show the same really, really healthy markers that you'd see in these non-model or, or these, these model organisms. So I'm not so sure that what we see in our lab animals does rapidly translate to humans. So I would question whether or not one size fits all. I'm going to say that there's more to life than rats and flies. And again, this is we're debating aging. What do we need to do to slow down aging? What different ways can we now look at the aging problem? Now let's look at nature. So nature's found, she solved these problems. So you have here this weird looking salamander, it's an ulm, lived till at least 102 years. This rough-eye rockfish lived till 205 years. You have an ocean quag hog living over 507 years. Eastern box turtle living over 138 years. So these are our longevity extremists. This Greenland shark was estimated to live at least 512 years. So we have species that have naturally evolved longer lifespans, potentially longer health spans. But I'm going to argue that none of these species are really doing something that extraordinary. This is what we expect given their metabolic rate and where they live. But these guys, the bats, are doing something particularly unique. And this is one of the reasons why I've spent a, lot of, a few decades of my own life studying these magnificent creatures. So there are one in five of every living mammal is a bat. They're the only mammals that have achieved the ability of true self-powered flight, and flight is highly metabolically costly. Bats would expend three times more energy over the course of their entire lifespan than a similar sized non-flying mammal. But what's unique about them in terms of aging is that if you think about it, typically in nature, there is nearly a law. Small things have a really high metabolic rate, they live very fast, and they die young. Think of a shrew, think of a mouse. Big things, big, huge, large things, elephants, uh, blue, uh, blue whales, they live slow and they live long. They have a slow metabolic rate. And there's nearly a correlation in nature that body size can predict, metabolic rate can predict how long things live for. But bats book this trend. So what you see here is that this is from Steve Austin, 2010 paper, which really stimulated a lot of my research. There's 19 species of mammal that live longer than humans given their body size. And 18 of these are bats and one's a naked mole rat. And naked mole rats are showing amazing life extension adaptations. But we're going to talk about the bats today. So the longest lived bat was Myotis brantii. It holds a record. And Myotis brantii is seven grams. It's about a third of a fat lab mouse. But yet it was caught, the individual that holds a record was caught as an adult and was caught now 43 years later with no signs of aging. Now this is on the edge of what's actually possible. If you were to correct for body size, that's about the equivalent of 258 human years. That's what that individual can do. So bats seem to have evolved mechanisms to slow down the aging process. And so what I wanted to do is, as a bat biologist and a field biologist and zoologist, and also somebody who's been studying comparative genomics, I want to think, well, how can you study wild bats? We want to study wild bats as an alternative model system to uncover the molecular pathways that underlie extraordinary aging in mammals. Now think about most aging studies. They're done in lab animals. And babies born and sampled throughout the entire course of their life. That's how most aging studies work. And so I want to try and see, well, could we develop this as a method? And I'm going to show you a movie. And so the idea was, I had to try and find a population of the longest lived bat. We had to find a population where we could age the bats, which meant that these bats were caught as a baby because their finger bones are not yet fused. And what happened was we put a little microchip in so we could identify the individual. And we would catch that individual year after year after year at the same roost, which were these gorgeous churches in France. 
And we were able to then identify the individual and we'd be able to look at this little microchip and say, we caught this individual in 2010. This is now 2018. That individual is eight years of age. And we had to develop methods to be able to take a teeny tiny amount of blood. You couldn't bleed them. We wanted to take a little bit of tissue and we wanted to non-lethally sample them and develop the methods to see when we looked at different biological markers of aging, were bats doing something that was unique and different that maybe could underlie their healthy aging process? We were working with a grassroots organization called Britannia Vivante. And these, in France, they love their wildlife. And from the year 2000, they had been studying these populations, which meant that year after year after year, we were able to go back, catch the same individual, and we developed the methods to be able to study them. So these are wild species, and the individual that will live the longest will have the genotype of survival. And that's what we're looking for. So we focused on a whole bunch of different markers. And we asked the question, how do bats defy the aging process? What mechanisms have they evolved that maybe allow them to have much longer health spans that would be expected given their body size? So we initially looked at telomeres. So what, remember what telomeres are? These are the repetitive caps at the end of your chromosomes. And every time your cell replicates, they get shorter and shorter and shorter. Eventually, they become so short that it indicates that you have an old cell. And either the cell is removed or it sits there being old, causing problems, sending weird signals. So we want to know, in these longest-lived bats, these myotis myotis, did we find where their telomeres shortening with age, as would be expected, or they had evolved different mechanisms? So what we found was extraordinary. We found that in the longest-lived bats, their telomeres do not shorten with age. This was not attributable to telomerase, this enzyme that allows your telomeres to be maintained in your uh, germline cells, in your egg or your sperm. They seem to be maintaining their telomeres without expressing the enzyme telomerase. Now, this enzyme could be a little controversial because it's required to um, re-switch back on different cells and allow them to differentiate into different things. But cancer cells express telomerase. And so bats, there's been really no evidence of cancer ever in bats. And so they were extending their telomeres without telomerase. We did a whole bunch of evolutionary analysis and all the genes and methods that, and um, different proteins that potentially could be mediating this. And what we found is it seemed to be that genes involved in their DNA repair and certain parts of this alternative telomere lengthening mechanism seem to be evolving differently in bats than other mammals and maybe this underlay their ability to maintain their telomeres. <coughs> we also looked at their mitochondria. And what you'll find, again, mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. Bats have these really high metabolic rates. They've, they've been shown to um, have a 50-fold oxygen consumption doing certain activities, which is very, very different than other sized mammals. And the idea was, OK, are their mitochondria experiencing the same level of damage as would be expected given this high metabolic rate? Or do they have mechanisms to repair their damage? So we looked at how, whether or not you could find evidence for oxidative stress damage and metabolic damage in their mitochondria. And what we found was that, no, you didn't really see this level of damage as you would expect. They had this ridiculously high metabolic rate without the expected damage. And this meant that potentially bats were finding ways to either repair the damage or remove damaged mitochondria. So they're able to maintain their telomeres. They're able to somehow maintain their mitochondria. As we age, we become highly inflamed. Your immune system gets overactive. This could be because your mitochondria are breaking up. They're overstimulating your immune system. What we found when we looked at bats, when we looked at macrophages, so we looked at the immune cells of bats, we tried to see, are they different? Do they have a way of potentially dampening inflammation so that as they age, they don't experience the same level of inflammation, which is supposed to drive aging. We looked at mice, we looked at bats. These are pro-inflammation, anti-inflammation. What you find is like a balance. We compared bats and mice, and we find that mice have a much higher level of inflammation naturally when their immune cells are challenged with immune agonists than bats. So it looked like bats were, they were able to return to this homeostasis. So we challenged these bats, macrophages, to immune agonists, and we found that they were very quickly able to um, mount an inflammatory response, but then very quickly 
rectify it with an anti-inflammatory response. Now, what this simply means is that they're able to maintain their immunological homeostasis. They're able to return to a homeostatic state. But we looked at telomeres, mitochondria, immune genes. We also looked at the microbiome, but I'm not going to talk about what we had to do to guess the anal microbiome from bats right now. It doesn't change with age. I'll just say that much. But what we need to do is that really think about aging. Look at it. It's, it's, it's totally a holistic process. You can't just look at one pathway on its own. You have to look at it together. And to do this, we decided to use this whole blood transcriptomic approach. Now, this was a very difficult thing to do. I thank Huang Zhejia, my PhD student who was working on this at the time. And we developed methods whereby you could sequence the entire blood transcriptome from as little as 40 microliters of blood. So that's less than two little tiny drops. Um, it was a difficult thing to do. We did. And we wanted to ask the question, when you looked at blood as this overall physiological tissue, Again, you're going to find lots of different transcripts from different tissues in blood. There's leakage that goes on. Could we find that bats had a way of maintaining a, or stopping this dysregulation with age that we see? Could we uncover what they were doing at the molecular level? And to do this, what we want to do is we want to look at the blood transcriptome of bats as they age. Sequence all the genes that are expressed. Look for age-related transcriptional changes. We then also want to think, okay, we're just describing how these changes happen. We want to try and uncover what were the things that were regulating it. Because if we want to use bats as a proxy for what we have to do to slow down our aging, we're going to have to find the mechanisms that drive what we see. We also see these little things called the mirrorgnomes. These are potentially these underlying regulatory mechanisms from the same blood, from the same individual. We looked how they changed over time. And what we wanted to do was also compare them with other mammals. And again, there wasn't very many data sets out there right now of aging in mammals that weren't sick at the time. And so when we did this, and so this is based on an eight-year longitudinal study. It's the first study of its kind. What we found here is when you actually look at bats and you look at their top major changes in bats compared with humans, mice, and actually was wolves, because that was the only other data set that we had. And what you find here, and you just look at you know, the genes that are highly upregulated as they age. Blue means that they have a, a low, le uh, low level of regulation as they age. So you're looking for increase with age versus decrease with age. And right there, you can see the difference. Bats increase the maintenance of their DNA as they age. They're able to maintain and to also repair their damage. They've evolved these unique checkpoints too to make sure that as their cells are, are dividing and as their DNA is dividing that it's maintained. You didn't see any difference here really in, in what you see is their adaptive immunity. They seem to show the same um, adaptive immune senescence as you see in other mammals. Very interesting, you can look at a mice, they get really this pro-inflammatory um, transcription profile as they age, the bats don't do that, neither do we. So this was quite extraordinary. What I thought was really cool was, you know, does this method work? Let's go back and look at our model organisms. And what we found is that when you actually look at what happens with bats at the transcriptomic level, that they have naturally evolved known life extension protocols. So what you have to do to amount to make it live longer is you have to get a double dosage of P10. And this is, again, its expression increases with age in bats. They're doing that. Another one is this MYC. The way you make your model mice live longer is you decrease its expression. The bats were naturally doing this. These are just nine examples. But we already know that if you mess with these pathways, you can make your mice live longer. We found new genes and new pathways that have not been identified before. So I guess this is a proof of concept that the idea of going into the field and using a zoological approach, that you could uncover new ways of healthy aging. Here are some top 20 um, genes that are um, expressed, their increased expression with age, top 20 decrease to so their potential targets. We also found the microRNAs that regulate this. And again, microRNAs are these little genes that have this very pleiotropic effect and that can maintain and that can actually manage 
that transcriptome profile that you see in bats. If you're looking for potential mechanistic targets that we can have the same age of transcriptome as bats, these would be a way to start to do it. So what's our conclusions? What have they evolved? It's not simple. They seem to have lots of different life extension methodology. They're, you have an increase in exquisite DNA repair. You're able to remove damaged cells. I didn't even talk about auto autophagy, but it cre increases with age with bats. They maintain their telomeres. And they keep a balanced immunity. And it just seems, again, it's maintenance of self. Potentially, this is modulated by a whole bunch of these microRNAs, ones that we know and new ones that we found. So I hope I have told you tonight that by studying bats, we can uncover the molecular mechanisms that age mammals achieve extraordinary longevity. What's it going to mean? Let's go back here. Morbidity onset. This is the oldest one we want. But studying bats, I hope we could live to where 150, healthy. And how do we get from here to here? I think we're going to hear about it tonight. So I want to thank my lab and all the volunteers and everybody that we work with, and thank you for listening.